It's really good for me to be here as part of this really important celebration of the Human Genome Project and to talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities in, in the face of very striking disparities in the United States in both access and utilization of health care as well as in health status. So I want to highlight some of the key features of the patterns of disparities, and then I want you to think with me about what this all means um, and what are the opportunities for the Human Genome Project. So there are large racial ethnic disparities in access to health care in the United States. One way to look at that is to look at access to health insurance, and if we look at the percentage of Americans by race ethnicity who have access to any kind of health insurance, you can see that some populations, particularly Latinos and, and Native Americans, um, have relatively low access uh, to health care insurance. If we look at those who have access to public insurance, which is some insurance coverage but doesn't provide as much benefit, again you see some uh, minority populations, Latinos, uh, American Indians, and African Americans particularly, um, having high levels of access uh, to public health insurance. Another way to think about access to care um, uh, that is used by health service utilization researchers is to ask people um, if they had had a time in the past year when they needed medical care but did not get it for some reason. And again, if you look at those who report that they needed medical care but were unable to obtain it for some reason, you see minorities again um, overrepresented, uh, particularly among the Asian Pacific Islander population and the African American population. In addition to these um, markers of access to care, there's striking evidence of racial ethnic disparities in the quality and intensity of healthcare in the United States. Um, the 2003 report from the Institute of Medicine entitled Unequal Treatment documented that across virtually every medical intervention from the most simple medical procedures to the most high-tech procedures, minorities receive fewer procedures and poorer quality me medical care than whites. These differences persist even when you look at persons with the same level of health insurance, the same level of socioeconomic status, um, with the same stage in severity of disease. It's quite a pronounced pattern across a broad range of contexts within the American healthcare system. Just to give you an example of, of what we mean in terms of racial ethnic disparities in care, uh, I'll focus on one study. The IOM committee reviewed over 200 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications that documented these disparities. But think of Dr. Todd, Knox Todd, an emergency room physician at a UCLA medical center um, and asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency room with a long bone fracture, a broken bone in the arm or legs, does that patient's ethnicity uh, predict whether that patient gets pain medication or not? And he found that over the prior year, 55% of Latino patients with a long bone fracture had received no pain medication compared to 26% of non-Hispanic whites. Dr. Todd was a good uh, researcher. He worried about confounding, and he statistically adjusted for the age of the patient, uh, whether they spoke English or not, whether they had insurance or not, whether they got injured on the job or not, what time they showed up at the ER, how long that they, they spent in the ER. But across virtually, after taking into account all of these potential factors, um, Latino ethnicity emerged as the single strongest predictor of whether the patient would get pain medication or not. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta, repeated the same study at three large emergency rooms in Atlanta and found exactly the same thing looking at black and white patients. An African American with a long bone fracture goes to the emergency room in Atlanta, is less likely to receive pain medication compared to a white patient. And so this leaves us with this um, core paradox that we need to, to understand. How is it possible in, in a country with the best trained uh, medical workforce in the world with providers who wake up every day meaning to do their best for their patients can still produce a pattern of care that appears to be so discriminatory. Um, one of the answers uh, for this uh, that the IOM committee identified, for which we now even have much more scientific data than back in 2003 documenting it, is a phenomenon that social psychologists have been studying for 50 years. It's called unconscious or unthinking discrimination based on negative stereotypes. It's not about race, it's not about American society, it's about how human beings process information. We put things into categories to simplify the complex cognitive information we are bombarded with each day. The question is, based on our socialization and based on our society, do we hold negative implicit attitudes about some of those categories? And if we do, 
what the research clearly indicates, all of us do this, without our conscious awareness, it's an automatic process, there's no intent, we will treat persons in that category that we hold negative stereotypes about differently. That is, we will discriminate against them, but we wouldn't actually even know that we are doing it. Um, the typical healthcare provider would say, I would never do this, and persons who believe they would never do it, it's a person per, uh, clearly set up to do it. These, this is well-established, well-documented, routine processes about how we all process information. There's overwhelming uh, scientific evidence in the social sciences that minorities are also um, negatively stereotyped in the United States, um, with African Americans being more stereotyped than any other group. This is national data for the United States from the General Social Survey done by the University of Chicago um, in 1990. Um, I'm showing you 1990 data. It has multiple stereotypes. They've been tracking two stereotypes uh, since then, and the patterns have not changed dramatically since 1990. But you see that 44% of whites believe that blacks are lazy, 56% that blacks prefer to live off welfare, 51% that blacks are prone to violence, 29% that blacks are unintelligent. Now, persons who hold these stereotypes, again, are not bad people. Um, there's a lot of research to suggest that this is what American culture has taught them. One illustration of that is from a project called the Beagle Project, where a group of psychologists have put American culture and that is the books, newspapers, magazine articles that the average college-educated American would read uh, in their lifetime have put it in one database. And if you have American culture in a database, you can then look at associations between uh, particular uh, words in that database uh, with, with other adjectives in the database. And what they've found, for example, that when the word black occurs in American culture, what most commonly co-occurs with it is poor, then violent, then religious, then lazy, then cheerful, then dangerous. So several of the stereotypes I just showed you from the General Social Survey are in fact the associations that normally occur within American culture. Um, for the fun of it, when white occurs, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. When female occurs, distant, warm, gentle, passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. These are just some of the actual associations that exists within American culture, and the point I'm making is the negative racial stereotypes are what uh, people, in fact, have been fed. Uh, the good news is research suggests that these stereotypes can be reduced and the tendency to socially categorize under some conditions. There's a wonderful paper by Diana Burgess and colleagues that illustrates that in the interest of time. Uh, I will not discuss that. But what are the implications of these racial ethnic disparities in access to care and the quality of care? Um, it means that we shouldn't assume that the existence of, of, of breakthroughs in genomic medicine will reach all populations. And we need to ensure equitable access to genomic medicine of all populations in the United States. Um, multiple barriers um, to accessing all the benefits of uh, genomic medicine needs to be effectively addressed. We need to identify all of them and effectively address them. We need to make systematic efforts to build trust and partnerships with historically marginalized populations who already approach a medical encounter uh, with, with reservations often. Uh, public outreach programs can enhance understanding and awareness of genomics, and we need them. Uh, we need to strengthen the genomic education of healthcare providers. And we need to enhance science literacy at all educational levels in the United States so there's a, a broader appreciation on the part of all of the potential of genomic medicines. I also want to talk about the fact that there are uh, striking racial, racial ethnic disparities, not only in access and utilization of care, but in the distribution of health problems in the first place. If you look at national data for the United States, you see two major patterns in the data. There are groups that have had a long history of economic exploitation, social marginalization, uh, and geographic isolation have markedly elevated rates of poor health outcomes. And that's true for blacks or African Americans, for American Indians and Alaska Natives, and for Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. These groups have worse health than the US average. Um, immigrant populations, uh, like Asians and Latinos, tend to have better health, but that health advantage declines rapidly over time, with some recent data finding that um, although Latinos as a whole seem to do better, if you look at US-born Latinos, they don't differ from African Americans in health. Other research suggests by 21 years in the United States, the health profile of Latinos, um, they've lost the health advantage uh, that Latinos um, come to the U.S. with. Um, the patterns of disparities in health exist across a broad range of medical conditions, 
and exist across the entire life course. So you see higher age-specific death rates, for example, for American Indians and for African Americans from birth to the retirement years. So it's not at one stage of the life course, it is across the entire life course. These disparities not only exist today, but they're quite persistent over time. Uh, if we use um, life expectancy at birth as an indicator of that, um, you could see in 1950 there was an eight-year gap between blacks and whites in, in, in life expectancy. The good news is um, it's smaller today, but there's a five-year gap uh, in 2006, which is still substantial, given that life expectancy increases nationally overall by about two-tenths of one year uh, from one year to the next. If we froze the life expectancy of, of whites, it would take African Americans about 25 to 30 years to catch up uh, to the health that whites currently have. Another way of thinking of that is we can look at the life expectancy of whites in 1950 and ask how long did it take for African Americans to catch up to the life expectancy that whites had in 1950, and we'd see it was 40 years later in 1990. So there's a 40 year gap, 30 to 40 year gap in all of the comparisons here between two populations living in the same society. Um, American Indians uh, served by the Indian Health Service is one group we have data on over time. The Indian Health Service started in 1955, and you can see for this health outcome, deaths from diabetes, the dramatic increases in diabetes death rates for American Indians over time, with the gap being markedly larger today compared to whites than it was in 1955. Minorities not only have higher rates of disease, they get sick at younger ages, they have more severe illness, and they die sooner than whites. I'll give you two snapshots of this. Um, the CARDIA study is a large multi-site uh, NIH-funded study of cardiovascular disease and been following young adults now for 25 years. A 20-year follow-up study found that incident heart failure under the age of 50 was 20 times more common among African Americans compared to whites. Another Indicator of this is using a concept that researchers are calling allostatic load. It's looking at systematic biological dysregulation across multiple physiological systems. And using national data for the United States, these are the mean scores on allostatic load by age. Um, and you can think of allostatic load as a summary measure of biological aging. And what you can see if you look at, at whites at 55 to 64, the health that they have captured by, by, uh, by allostatic load, African Americans have it 10 years earlier. So there's a 10-year gap between blacks and whites biologically um, in terms of their, their overall health status. How do we make sense of these racial ethnic differences? And, and what, what does this all have to do with, with genomics? I think we need to remember that race reflects simultaneous unmeasured confounding for both genetic factors and environmental exposures. Race reflects unmeasured confounding due to the current social environment, but also to exposures over the entire life course and to biological adaptation to these environmental exposures. This includes uh, changes in gene expression um, as well. Uh, as we make sense of these differences then, we need to think of what are all of these social exposures that, that differentially or distinctively uh, affect minority populations. One of them is low socioeconomic status. In the United States, socioeconomic status measured by income, education, occupational status is a stronger predictor of variations in health than race ethnicity. Uh, most people we focus, our healthcare systems historically have focused on race ethnicity, but SES is a larger predictor of variations in health. Here is national data for the United States looking at premature mortality, that is death before the age of 65, by income level, and it indicates that low income Americans are three times more likely to die before the age of 65 compared to high income Americans. But what we also know using national data is that the health disadvantage of minorities is not simply a matter of lower income and education. Minorities have elevated levels of illness even at comparable levels of education and income. Let me illustrate that with national data and life expectancy at age 25. There's a five-year gap between blacks and whites. Within the white population, there's a 6.4-year gap by education, making the point I made earlier that the gaps within each race by socioeconomic status are larger than the racial gap. Within African Americans, a 5.3-year gap by levels of education. But this is the problem. At every level of education, there's still the persistence of a racial difference. A uh, 3.1 year gap in life expectancy between black and white high school dropouts. And that difference increases as education increases. So it clearly illustrates there are powerful forces linked to socioeconomic status that drives health. There are powerful forces linked to race as well that also drives health. Just to give you another illustration of this persistence of the racial gap um, is a study of a cohort of, of um, 
physicians, all black graduating from Meharry Medical School and all white graduating from Johns Hopkins about the same time. They're all medical doctors working in the United States. They all work under relatively similar conditions. We shouldn't expect to find racial differences in health among them. But we found that the black physicians have higher risk of cardiovascular disease, have incidence rates of diabetes and hypertension twice as high, higher risk of, of coronary artery disease, and once they get sick, they're much more likely to die compared to the white physicians. Why does race still matter so much? Um, genetics could be one part of it. There's also research, though, that indicates that there are social factors that seem to play a role. One of them is capturing exposures over the life course and thinking not only about current levels of education, but what has been your exposure to social adversity over your entire life. Another is that all of the indicators of income, education, occupational status don't mean the same thing in each racial group. There are racial differences, for example, in income um, at every level of education, and there are racial differences in wealth at every level of income. Um, and then there's other evidence suggesting the persistence of race-related aspects of life that I will use the term racism to capture that, that captures additional pathogenic factors that have health consequences. So this is data, for example, from the United States nationally that shows that compared to whites, blacks, and Hispanics receive less income at the same levels of education, have less wealth at equivalent levels of income, have less purchasing power, which means the cost of goods and services are more expensive in the places where they live, so their dollars don't stretch as far. Um, one of the distinctive social exposures then is that the minority poor are poorer than the white poor. Um, I'm illustrating that with data from the US Census, looking at wealth, and looking for every dollar of wealth whites have, blacks have nine cents and Latinos have 12 cents. And actually this is before the stock market crashed um, and the housing bubble, it's actually worse than it was. Uh, if we look at the poorest 20% of the US population, for every dollar of wealth poor whites have, poor blacks have one penny and poor Latinos have two pennies. And even the, among the richest quintile of the US population, for every dollar of wealth rich whites have, rich African Americans have 31 cents and rich Latinos have 35 cents. So you see the persistence of uh, uh, differences in economic status even when we look at similar patterns of, of income. The added burden of racism. Does, does it really make sense to talk about racism and its consequences for health? There's a growing body of research suggesting there are multiple mechanisms by which institutional mechanisms of racism and, and interpersonal dimensions of racism affect health. In the interest of time, I will talk about two of them. One is perceived discrimination um, and the consequences it has for health and is a risk factor for health. Um, there's striking scientific evidence that comes from audit studies that document the persistence of discrimination in contemporary society. An audit study is a study where you hold everything identical, the only thing you vary is race. So here's an audit study of employment where blacks, black and white males with identical Resumes applied for jobs. The only difference was the race of the person handed in the resume. They threw a wrinkle into this study by having one of the white and African-American males said he'd served an 18-month prison sentence for cocaine possession, uh, so he had a criminal record. What you ex the study found what you expected to find. Whether you were black or white, if you had a criminal record, you were less likely to get a call back for a job. But the study also found what we did not expect to find. It was easier for a white male with a criminal record to get a call back for a job than an African-American male whose record was clean. The study was replicated in New York City and found exactly the same thing. Um, uh, the white felon gets a higher callback for jobs than Latinos and African-Americans with an identical resume and a clean record. Does this discrimination have any consequences for health? Um, this is a review paper we did recently looking at uh, over 109 studies in the last three years in the PubMed database that found the discrimination perceived discrimination, predicts the risk of disease, predicts substance use and health behaviors, predicts the incidence of disease, and predicts the ways in which minorities seek health care. To give you a concrete sense of this social exposure, this is the everyday discrimination scale that I developed. Um, it's a scale that captures one dimension of, dis of discrimination, not the big things, but the little things, the little indignities that occur in the lives of individuals, like receive, being treated with less courtesy and less respect than others, receiving poorer service, others acting as if you think you are not smart. And just to illustrate the power of this risk factor, this is work from Tenney Lewis, uh, which was at Yale University at the time. These are all published studies using just the everyday discrimination scale, adjusting for other risk factors for disease, 
and higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts higher rates of coronary artery calcification, predicts higher rates of inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein, <coughs> higher levels of blood pressure, lower birth weight among uh, pregnant women, uh, higher levels of cognitive impairment among the elderly, poorer sleep objectively and subjectively assessed, higher mortality in a sample a prospective study of the elderly, and higher levels of visceral fat. So across a broad range of conditions, the, the stress of discrimination is operating like other chronic stressors in predicting poorer health uh, for minorities. Another dimension of discrimination I want to talk about briefly is place. Um, you might be surprised to know that, but among t um, social scientists and public health researchers, a common phrase that they now use is that your zip code is a stronger predictor of your health in the United States than your genetic code because there's such a powerful relationship between place and health. Let me illustrate that with data uh, from CDC. Uh, Mississippi stands out as a state with the highest rates of heart disease uh, mortality in the United States of any state. Whites in Mississippi have the highest rates for whites nationally. African Americans in Mississippi have the highest rates for African Americans nationally. And this is by county in Mississippi um, and showing the rates of, by quintiles of heart disease. This is it for African Americans, and I'll put the two distributions together. And what you find in the state with the worst outcomes nationally, there is no overlap in the distribution with the whites who are doing the worst still having lower rates of heart disease mortality than the African American women who are doing the best. And it illustrates the, the power of place um, and, and race to shape particular outcomes in the United States. Residential segregation is a driver uh, of these racial differences in outcome. Uh, observers of American society have said since Myrtle in 1944 that segregation was a key to understanding outcomes in this country. Uh, John Seller, a historian at Duke University, wrote a book on the origins of segregation where he argued that residential segregation by race was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States because it's beneath the radar screen of most individuals, but it's a powerful predictor of outcomes and access to opportunity and resources in American society. What does segregation have to do with health? Well, the research suggests that segregation determines your access to education and quality of education, your access to employment opportunities. Where you live determines the quality of neighborhood environments, the quality of housing environments. It determines whether it's easy or not to eat a healthy diet, to get a regular exercise, it determines your access to quality medical care. Basically what I'm saying is the research suggests that segregated communities are unhealthy communities and there are multiple uh, social, chemical, physical dimensions on which communities vary in being healthy and on all of these dimensions, uh, segregated communities tend to be um, more unhealthy communities. How powerful is segregation? in shaping um, access to educational um, and socioeconomic outcomes in the United States. David Cutler is a noted economist at Harvard. He did a study, national study for the United States, looking at black and white uh, young people making it economically. And he concluded that if you could, in, in, in fancy economic models I cannot even fully describe, if you could eliminate statistically segregation in the United States, you would completely erase black-white differences in income, education, and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds. All of that driven by place and how powerful the location of place is. Um, segregation dramatically, research shows, determines access to high-quality medical care on multiple dimensions of medical care. And two eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, concluded that in the 171 largest cities, there's not even one city where whites live under similar conditions to African Americans, and concluded that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. So when we talk about race then, we're talking about groups living under very different environmental conditions. This slide shows the level of segregation in South Africa on the legally mandated apartheid, a segregation score of 90 meant that 90% of black South Africans would have to move to have an even distribution of blacks and whites in that country. In the 2000 census, most of America's largest cities have a level of segregation only slightly lower than that on the legally mandated apartheid in South Africa. What does this all mean for the Human Genome Project? We really need to think more carefully about what effects do these distinctive residential environments have on normal physiological processes. 
How are normal adaptive and regulatory systems affected by the harsh residential environments of minorities in the United States? And to what extent does uh, minorities' biological adaptation to their residential environments lead to some biological profiles that are different from other groups and to some distinctive patterns of interaction between biological and, and social exposures? As uh, Michael Meany uh, said it, any successful attempt to constructively leverage the remarkable advances of the genomic era will depend upon our ability to understand genetic influences and their interactions with the environmental context with which they operate. And I'm saying that when we think of race, we're talking about groups that are living on the very, very different environmental context. Uh, future genomic research needs to give increased attention to the comprehensive, detailed, and rigorous characterization of the risk factors and resources in the psychological, social, chemical, and physical environment that may interact with the genetic factors to affect health risk. Much of the research to date on race and genetics has emphasized gene frequency differences over gene expression differences. Given that racial and socioeconomic differences in residential and occupational environments, more systematic attention should be given to the understanding of the contribution of epigenetics to disease risk and to racial disparities and socioeconomic disparities in health. Uh, there are suggestions in the literature um, that there might be striking epigenetic effects linked to, to um, harsh environmental exposures, um, uh, particularly um, epigenetic effects linked to the immune system, for example. These are just suggestions. I think what we, what we need is more systematic effort to, to deeply understand these patterns that are emerging. What I'm saying is we need a more integrated science to better elucidate how an individual's zip code interacts with their genetic code to affect health risk, how the multiple dimensions of the social, physical environment combine additively or interactively with each other and with innate and acquired biological factors and accumulate over the life course to affect the onset of illness and the progression of disease. So my concluding thoughts. There are many non-genetic factors contribute to health disparities. So genetics alone doesn't hold a solution, but I think it's an important piece of the puzzle that we want to maximize fully the benefits. Racial groups differ on a broad range of environmental risk and exposures. We need, I think, a trans-NIH, a number of trans-NIH initiatives to develop improved definitions and measurement of the social environment in all of its complexity. I think we are not at the stage now where geneticists can work with a social genome that is explicitly characterized. Third, gene environmental interactions are central to understanding the role of genomics and disease. We need better integration of social environmental exposures with innate and acquired biological factors. Fourth, conclusions about the contribution of genetics should be based on direct test of genetic traits, and that sounds like common sense, but if you read the medical literature, that's not what is still happening today. Fifth, research on race and genetics should exercise caution in making generalizations and inferences to entire racial populations when coverage of the diverse ancestral groups is limited. Sixth, given the distinctive environments of racial minorities in the United States, more systematic attention should be given to identifying and understanding potential epigenetic effects. And finally, more attention needs to be given now to ensure that the full potential of genomics becomes accessible to all. I believe this will require reforming current infrastructures within our healthcare system and developing best practices that can be routinely applied within the healthcare context. Thank you very much. We have time for a quick question. If someone can head to a microphone. I have a question. Um, did you try to look at the, the racial um, population of the health care providers? Like, I would imagine because, like, doctors maybe are more white, and it's just this unconscious need to help people similar to themselves. So you had a comparison of the white doctors versus black doctors, but the people who treated them, you know. Yes, I, I'm assuming you're referring to the work um, that the IOM Committee's Unequal Treatment Report of to, the, to what extent did the patterns of disparities in the quality of intensity of care exist when the provider was in fact African-American compared to when the provider was white. We were very interested in that issue. There just wasn't research. There was one published study, and when you looked at it carefully, we wondered how it became a published study. Um, given these conclusions, um, you know, it, it used 
it used the, the, the race of the provider on record in, in, a, in an academic medical center who was not necessarily the provider who actually provided care to the individual. It was a, a looking at patient records. So I, I would say since then, there is a body of, of, of literature that has looked at that and have used, some of them have used vignettes and, and have looked at the race of the provider and find that the processes of implicit bias exist across races. Whites are more likely to have it in African Americans, but many African American providers also have implicit biases among blacks. After all, they are part of American society. They have been fed the same um, levels of stereotypes. So it exists to some extent, to a lesser extent, but it also exists among providers. It's really not about the provider race, it's about what the provider has, has inculcated uh, uh, yes. from their larger culture. I just want to add a comment. This is very similar to the prejudice against um, scientists, like female minority scientists. Um, they find that even in, well, the idea is to increase the number of females in all settings at the higher levels especially, but even at the higher levels, women are prejudiced against, prejudiced against women scientists unconsciously, you know. Let me just use this opportunity to emphasize the fact that I illustrated the impact that this implicit biases have for race. But it's really not just about race. It's about any social category. So if you have implicit biases against gay people, against fat people, against old people, similar processes will operate. Uh, and where societies differ is what are the social outgroups that are focused on in a particular society and what has been the history of that particular society. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. As you can see from the last two speakers, there is a very uh, rich uh, set of issues and important issues around genomics and society. And so the next video we'll watch before the lunch break is about genomics and society, a historical view.